here we are in week three of Advent, four weeks before the four weeks before Christmas that prepare us to celebrate both the arrival of the baby Jesus in Bethlehem and the second coming of Jesus. We had the prophet's candle, the candle of hope in week one, the Bethlehem candle, the candle of faith in week two, and today we have the shepherd's candle for week three. It's a pink one. And uh, the pink candle represents the pure joy of the shepherds on hearing the angel's message of the birth of the Messiah, Jesus. So let's do our candle lighting. First one, then the second, and then the third. And soon we find ourselves realising that light breaks into darkness, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The room can never be dark whilst ever, ever there's a light there. Even the light of a single match drives away darkness. <clears throat> In the same way, that kind of joy breaks into suffering and slowly and steadily increasing in measure as time passes. And certainly we're well aware of the contrast between the two. And yet we're also curiously warmed and comforted by the light of the candles. This simple, simple but ancient symbol somehow connects us with the, the, the events of Christmas and fill us with a rather unique kind of joy, isn't it? I'm not talking about happiness, okay? I'm not talking about happiness here. Happiness and joy are two very different things and we're going to be looking at the difference today. So to kick off our message this morning, let's have a look at what joy is not. Okay, we think that if we could only get that new car, that new house, that new outfit, if the children get what they want for Christmas, if only we could get more stuff, we will have joy. But we don't, do we? Within a few hours, the novelty wears off. We've got to wash the car. <laughs> Clean the house. Clean the house. And, you know, the dress has been worn once. Can't ever wear that again. All right? So we just don't find joy in material possessions, do we? What about experiences? I know that's a big deal these days, isn't it? Everyone's selling experiences. Like taking that dream holiday. If only I can take that holiday, I'll be full of joy. And we're certainly happy while we're there, aren't we? If only I can get tickets to that concert or get to the movies to see that blockbuster this Christmas. That'll be great. I'll have joy if I can do that. Or maybe surf some. You know, if only I can get out there and catch some of those perfect waves down on Main Beach, I'll have joy. If I can sit down in peace with friends or family and enjoy a great bottle of wine, I'll have joy. But we don't, do we? It's really nice while we're doing it. But what happens afterwards? Once the momentary pleasure of our experience ends, we're back where we started, looking for the next bigger and greater experience to top that one off. Maybe that one will bring us joy. I think what we're missing here is the fundamental difference between happiness and joy. The Americans have the right to happiness, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. That's, a, that's in the U, 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 United States Declaration of Independence. It's legislated. Unfortunately, what this does is create a culture that regards the pursuit of happiness as a basic human right guaranteed and protected by their government. Go figure. A culture consumed by the need to acquire stuff to make them happy, to chase after experiences that will make them happy. And we're not talking about that today. 
We're not talking about the pursuit of happiness. We're here to learn about joy. Happiness is a feeling that's here one minute and gone the next. So what about, I want to talk about joy, miraculous joy. That supersedes our stuff. <laughs> it doesn't have to be manufactured and it's totally not dependent on the moment. This type of joy comes from God alone. Joy can often be experienced in a worship context or when a Christian reflects about salvation, eternal life or Jesus. You know, Christians can experience joy all sorts of places, or walk through a forest, or walk along the beach on a glorious day, standing on the V-wall and watching a hundred dolphins surfing their way into the river. All these things bring us joy, don't they? It's the eager anticipation about wonderful things to come. The shepherds experienced this as they ran to Bethlehem to see Jesus. It's interesting, you know, three years ago today, I was standing in the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Right? And I actually visited the spot down in the cave where Jesus was actually born. And I saw the manger. And I knelt at the, there's this big Bethlehem star thing uh, on the floor there. And um, I knelt there just like everyone else did. And I kissed that star as the point place where Jesus was born. It's just an amazing experience. If ever you get the chance to do it, by all means, go for it. So let's have a look at what the scripture has to say about joy. God fills us with joy, according to Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we cannot experience, exercise our own will to experience joy. I'm going to be joyful. I am going to be joyful. No matter what I am going to be. That doesn't work, does it? It just doesn't work. It comes from God alone. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such there is no law. Joy is part of that package of fruit, that bunch of grapes that God, the Lord Jesus wants you to have in your life. He came that we might have joy, John said, and that these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. 1 John 1, 4. 4. Joy is both a gift from God and a fruit of being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. These things were written that you might really enjoy your life. And I hope you are, as a believer, that you can have that inner joy in the midst of the chaos and challenges that we face every day. This is one way that we overcome our circumstances. You know, John also writes, no one can take that joy from us. As you can see, it's written in red. These are the words of Jesus. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. No one can... You don't let anyone steal your joy. Fair enough. Joy of the Lord is your strength, so the prophet said. No matter what circumstances we encounter, no one can take this away. And joy rests in things from God, such as salvation and righteousness. The psalmist writes, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. David had lost his joy. He wants it back. He prays real hard for it. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. The difference between David and us is that he had the Holy Spirit on him. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the presence of God living within us. Amen. No one can take that joy from us. Depending on which translation you choose, joy appears more than a hundred times in the Bible. It's kind of important. It's an absolute miracle. And so the big idea for today is this that the Christmas story is ultimately about God's love bringing each and every one of us 
lost in sin, into his life of joy. That's the big, big story for today. So we're going to walk through our Bible reading for this morning. So Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. What do we need to learn about joy from the shepherds? Well, if joy is not found in material things, and if it's not found in manufactured experiences, if it's not momentary, and it is miraculous, what did the shepherds witness about joy that maybe we can learn from today? Well, here's the first thing about joy we can learn about from the shepherds. It's joy that's painted on the canvas of darkness. This is what the scripture says in the first verse of our reading. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields. And then it says this, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to them. It's really, really dark out there. No lights, no street lights, no car headlights, nothing. It's pitch black, except for the starlight and the moonlight, depending on what time of the month it is, isn't it? So if you're a shepherd, and I know this is pretty obvious, if there's a time of day when you're most prone to predators, it's at night. And here, they are, here are these shepherds, and I understand that in our nativity scenes, sometimes we paint them up a bit, don't we? We make them clean and nice, fresh clothes, all nicely, beautifully laundered and everything. No smell. Culturally, they weren't deemed to be very high in the strata of Bethlehem culture. Many within that society had contempt for shepherds. Their vocation didn't have a lot of joy ingrained in it. Their whole life is about taking care of sheep, sheep who are foolish, who will run towards predators instead of away from them, who will injure themselves, who will even run over cliffs without looking. And the angels came to those shepherds at night. Those shepherds, chosen by the angels, were not well off. They weren't well off enough even to access, have access to a warm cave in the cold, dark winter nights in Bethlehem. I've been in those caves. The rich people, their, their shepherds brought the, the sheep into the caves at night and then they could just block the entrance to the cave and the sheep would be in the central sleeping area and then there's these little alcoves cut into the, cut into the rock and that's where the family slept. All right? These guys didn't have that. They probably made pens out of rock. <laughs> the whole place is littered with rock, so that's no great imagination there. And they probably kept the sheep inside, you know, probably a waist-high rock, rock, uh, rock ball there enclosure. That's all they had. And it's cold there at night in winter. I've been there at night in winter, and it's cold. And it could be miserable. So the first thing about joy that I learn in this passage is that God always paints with joy on a very dark canvas. And when I say dark canvas, maybe there's some of you think, well, yeah, that's the story of my life. I'm in a very dark place. You know, you might have had problems with your health this year. Maybe you had lost some or all of your retirement savings to scammers. The dreams that you've had for your life have not turned out even remotely close. And I want you to know that is exactly the kind of canvas that God paints on. The wreckage, the train wreck that is many of our lives, this is where God goes to work. Amen. Now recently I found an article online and it had the greatest title I've ever seen. It says, Christmas is for those who hate it most. And it's written by a pastor by the name of Matt B. Redmond. I'm going to read some of it for you. Jesus came for those who look in the mirror and see ugliness. Jesus came for daughters whose fathers never told them they were beautiful. 
Christmas is for those who go to Friday raffles and midweek bingo alone. Christmas is for those whose lives have been wrecked by cancer. And for you, the thought of another Christmas seems like an impossible dream. Christmas is for those who would be nothing but lonely if not for social media. Christmas is for those who've lost someone very dear to them and grief is threatening to flip you over the edge. Christmas is for the son whose father keeps giving him fishing gear. Good fun. But what he really wants is art materials. Christmas is for smokers who cannot quit even in the face of a death sentence. Christmas is for prostitutes and porn stars who long for love in every wrong place. Christmas is for college students who are sitting in the midst of the family and already cannot wait to get out for another drink. Christmas is for those who traffic in failed dreams. Christmas is for those who have squandered the family name and fortune. They want home, but they cannot imagine a warm reception. Christmas is for parents watching their children's marriage fall into disarray. Christmas is really about the gospel of grace for sinners. Because of all that Christ has done on the cross, the manger becomes the most hopeful place in a universe darkened with hopelessness. And in the irony of all ironies, Christmas is for those who will find it the hardest to enjoy. It really is for those who hate it most. So even if you don't feel like celebrating this Christmas, it's okay. God creates masterpieces of art on dark canvases. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Well, the next thing I hear about this is a joy that meets great fear with greater promise. This is what, what happens, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And you can't blame the shepherds. I'm sure they were having a party time with the sheep in the field. Not. <laughs> it's dark and cold, probably with the cold wind blowing up the, up the, the gully right over them. Could even be wet. And all of a sudden the glory of the Lord shines around them. We have a lot of songs about the glory of the Lord. I just want to remind you, if you read all the way through the Bible, there are times when the glory of the Lord killed people. And let's not, not forget that. We all like to say that if God's glory literally shone in this room, at this moment, that we would all raise our hands and worship. In reality, it would be so painfully bright, they would probably be crawling under the chairs thinking, man, Bakker had just been nuked. <laughs> until we realised that it was the glory. The shepherds were filled with great fear, but I love this. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognise him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the, in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those with whom God is pleased. In one moment, in one split second, the angel has announced that that 4,000 year old promise of God had been fulfilled. That one in the garden, in Genesis 3, it had been fulfilled. Those promises to David, you will, you will, you will have a, a king on your throne forever from your name. Right? All those promises of Isaiah, 
of Micah, all fulfilled in a moment. And the shepherds were really scared, I don't blame them. But what we see here is a joy that meets great fear with a greater promise, doesn't it? The shepherds ran over to that manger. And the manger is not a, in the manger there's not a Hebrew book that says, this is, this is how to live your good life now. There's no toolbox in that manger that's a symbol of your need to get to work. They look over and what do they see? They see a baby. Our God is not only the most joyous being in the universe, he is the most humble. David Jeremiah wrote this, he said, The Lord of creation chose to enter this world quietly amid an unquiet scene. It was by heavenly design that he came into the world, not in the relative comfort of the inn, but in some farmer's seedy shed. A homeless birth was part and parcel of a homeless life. Our promise is a person. And so it's a joy that is painted on the canvas of darkness. It's a joy that meets great fear with a greater promise. But then the next thing it does is, is this. It's also a joy that creates a response. The angels go away and then the shepherds say this. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village. I love that. They hurried, didn't they? They took off. They took off with what? They took off with an amazing message burned into their hearts and eyes. And they found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. It's a steep climb out of those fields up into Bethlehem. Steep, rocky, dangerous. Not much fun at all. But they hurried, they would have known it like they knew their own hands, even in the pitch dark. It's amazing, isn't it? The scripture goes on to tell us, after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had told them about this child. All, all who heard Hang on, what's going on here? All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. You talk about bringing rights in the kingdom for these shepherds. What have you ever done? Oh, we shared the gospel with Mary and Joseph. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good, isn't it? We shared the message of the angels with Mary and Joseph. They shared. Why did they share it? They should have shared it because of the sheer joy. They went around and they told everyone about the birth of this little baby. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. I love that. Now this is Luke writing this. He has stuff about Mary and her thoughts that no one else has got. Almost everything we know about Mary comes from Luke, the beloved physician, right, who was with her. So Mary kept these things in her heart and thought about them often. I mean, what happens when you catch a glimpse of God? You treasure it. Mary could have had bitter memories about the travel arrangements. Remember, we talked about that last week. The lack of planning, the constant need to improvise. But in a cave full of animals, hay and manure, Mary kept all these things treasured in her heart. That night she had to contend with the shepherds, loudly recounting the appearances of the angels. They probably woke the baby up several times. But just before dawn, when everyone except Mary was still asleep, she gathered a tapestry of memories. Just think about it. The beautiful appearance of Gabriel. 
the look on Elizabeth's face when she turned and saw Mary. The busyness of packing for the journey, all the rejections at the inns around town and at their own family dwellings, rejected by their own family. The nervous, frustrated father and the tiny hands of the newborn king. I would imagine she wept and smiled. She would have experienced an orchestra of emotions in concert with the breeze that swept through the Bethlehem, Bethlehem Hills that night, just like a newly released spirit. We each have opportunities to capture memories of Christ when we follow him. Knowing that he became our saviour gives us a reason for joy. It's good news worth celebrating and joy worth finding. And lastly, it's a joy that fills our lives with meaning. I love verse 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising them and praising God for all they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. Full stop. That's it. What do we do now? The shepherds went back. It doesn't say they went on a tour throughout the land. You know, speaking to huge crowds. They didn't start a podcast or a YouTube channel. They didn't start a global Zoom conference. They went back to those same sheep. They went back into the darkness. They went back to a very thankless job. They went back to being held in, in contempt. They went back to the sheep. So their station in life hadn't changed at all, had it? But guess what had changed? The shepherds had changed. When this holiday season is over, there are still nappies to be changed, beds to be made, lawns to be made, there are still meetings we have to do, still houses to be cleaned, and there are still appointments to keep, and so on and so forth. In other words, there's so much mundaneness in life, but it's the joy of the Lord inside of us like the shepherds now carry. That fills all of that with meaning. Why? It's like the ch children's song says, the king is in residence here. Amen? The king is in residence here. You know, at first blush, it's unreasonable to be joyful in the midst of the darkness of the world, isn't it? Completely unreasonable. It's unreasonable to be joyful in the midst of the darkness you might be experiencing in your life <coughs> unless the Lord is at hand, unless hope has come, unless peace has come, unless forgiveness has come. And friends, hope has come. Forgiveness has come. Life has come. Whatever circumstances you're facing today, you can be full of joy. You can be strong in the Lord. You can draw on the supply of the Holy Spirit within you and come out on top. We may be challenged. We may be tired. We may be weeping in the night. But you know what the scripture says? Joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning, not six months from now. So next time you're facing troubles that seem to steal the joy, right from under your Christmas tree, be intentional about releasing the joy that's already inside of you. It's not hard to find. It's there. Laugh out loud at the devil and declare, Devil, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's the scripture. We sang it this morning. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Begin to praise and worship him. And when you stir up joy within your spirit, your strength will be renewed as well. And that type of strength is unstoppable, friends. Don't ever let the devil steal your joy. It's where your power lies. Remember, to let the, the Lord of joy, Jesus himself, guide you on your path. Choose to be full of joy and strong in the Lord. And draw on the supply of joy in the Holy Spirit within you. And you will come out on top. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.